All right, uh, if everyone could sit down. My name is Phil Weiser, and I am a Deputy Assistant Attorney General at the Justice Department. I can reiterate what Jim McDonald just said. We will be putting the transcripts up online. And for those who can't be physically here, we'll invite everyone's engagement, discussions of the issues. The folks who've joined us here have come from different parts of the country and some not so far within the great state of Iowa. Let me start by introducing them, and then we'll start with the moderated discussion like the one we just had. Sitting right next to me here, Brian Burr from the uh, Economics Department in Minnesota, where he also has earned the outstanding policy contribution from the American Agriculture Economic Association. Thank you for joining us. Rachel Goodyou, I believe you're native Iowan, is that right? Good to have you back home now, a professor at the University of California, Davis, where she is in the Resource Economics Department. Mary Hendrickson is someone known to many of those here. She's not too far at the University of Missouri. Uh, she's also a part-time farmer on her family's farm, I understand. Where she, she's just an occasional <laughs> farmer, I guess. Sitting next to her is John Lawrence. John is an agricultural economist at Iowa State and has been named one of the top five most influential people. Uh, top 25, not top five. I, I just promoted you a little bit there, John. See if you're paying attention. Top 25 most influential in the top, in the past 25 years. Chuck Wirtz uh, comes to us as an independent hog producer from here in Iowa. And finally, Patrick Woodall, who's the research director at Food and Water Watch, a nonprofit consumer organization. So you should notice, like the last time, there'll be folks with the jackets who are going to be asking you to submit your comments. Um, you can see them in the back of the room there. They will walk through. Take an index card. Feel free to give me your comments so I can work them into the questions. I've got some questions that will get us started. Um, a number of them feed off of some of the earlier discussions. The first is that farmers are increasingly concerned that they are squeezed in, 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 in terms of the supply chain. And one of the related concerns there that will hit more at the end uh, uh, sort of workshop in Washington is that the uh, differential between what's paid for at retail versus wholesale um, raises real concerns. And most particularly from an antitrust perspective, there has been discussions that buyer power, often called monopsony, is part of this equation. And I guess I'd like to ask folks to explain a little bit about the dynamics of the supply chain and where concerns arise. Patrick, if you might be able to start off on this. Sure. It's great to be here. We're very happy that this uh, workshop is being held and that DOJ and USDA are having these important and we think long overdue discussions on these issues. I think for us, what we see is that the decline in real farm gate prices and a steady increase in retail consumer prices for groceries shows that there's a big carve out in the middle where the biggest companies, the consolidated companies, are able to capture more and more of the value chain in the marketplace. This happens, I think, in part because larger companies are able to exert more buyer power, both over farmers, which has been shown in, uh, I think, all the livestock sectors pretty well, but also in other areas like the retail sector, which exerts tremendous pressure on food manufacturers, on produce marketers, and uh, even on consumers. So what we see is that even when grocery mergers occur that increase the kind of efficiencies, the, those efficiencies aren't really passed on to the consumers. They're captured by the companies and not delivered to the beneficiaries of, of the people buying food in the supermarket. Obviously, on the farm gate side, we see the opposite trend, which is the pressures by the meat packers and the shippers and the grocery chains are pushing down and down on farmers, so the real uh, the real farm gate prices for almost everything have been coming down for the past several decades, while the real cost to produce these goods has been going up. And this puts kind of a double squeeze on the situation. Farmers get a little less every year, consumers pay more every year, and the companies in the middle, the fewer and fewer companies in the middle, are taking a bigger bite. And that, I think, for consumers and for farmers is a, an extremely problematic situation. Mm -hmm. 
Chuck, um, you are obviously on the front lines raising hogs. Have you uh, experienced similar concerns? What's your perspective on this issue? Um, I'm an independent pork producer, and I'm uh, Todd Wiley happened to make mention of those of us that try and negotiate pigs and try and set the marketplace. I'm one of the, the people that uh, are selling 5% of the hogs in this country that is trying to set the price. It gets uh, extremely difficult at times, in fact, almost to the point where you want to give up and join the ranks of others. Uh, we're courted a number of times to, to, to sign shackle space agreements with packers, and we try and uh, resist doing that for the pure point that we believe that market transparency and market discovery is ultimately important for a free market to flourish. Um, we have always been in this marketplace price takers. We have never been able to be price makers. And uh, quite honestly, I don't have I think the, the, the power has even shifted out of the Packers' hands. Uh, some people want to try and take, uh, take aim at the Packers, but uh, the retail sector, in my opinion, has become so strong that uh, when I talk to them, when I sit in circles, sit around tables, and visit with them about challenges that they face in their industry, um, they, they pretty much echo the sentiment that we have felt for years and that they're, start, they're starting to be told um, this is what we'll pay for this particular cut of meat. If you want to sell it to us, fine, and if you don't, that's fine too. And so I think uh, the U.S. consumer needs to understand that, uh, that it's a very difficult situation out here continuing to try and produce food, not only for the people in this country, but for people around the world. That's challenging. John, what's your perspective on the uh, market structure and where the competitive concerns are? Well, I, uh, I think as both previous speakers said, there's concerns kind of at both ends. Uh, I think one of the things, as you mentioned, as you started the discussion on the farm to wholesale spread had widened over time. I think it's a, a part of that is we track prices and, and we don't necessarily track cost in that. There is research that does that. But part of it is, is we're buying a different product than we did a few years ago. There's more further processing, more convenience, more packaging, more advertising, and so on. That, that comes out of those margins. Uh, certainly in the hog side, as Chuck just said, with the small number in the, uh, in the spot market, I think that's a genuine concern. Um, where is price discovery going to occur? What, what are the functions of price discovery? What do we need it to do? Is it possible to go further downstream for that price discovery? Uh, is it possible to have other types of price discovery? Uh, and I think those are, those are questions that the, the industry is needing to wrestle with. In some regards, the, whether it be the convenience or, as Chuck said, the people who want to, to join the contracting, uh, its success is going to kill it uh, because many of them, they were so successful using somebody else discovering price to use in my formula. Uh, now there's nobody left to discover price. And so I think that's a challenge. I'm going to come back to this question with, um, Mary, but before doing, uh, Rachel, I know you've thought about this margins issue that people p p talked about. Any, any thoughts you'd want to share on that topic? Uh, sure, and I'll go uh, back to what John said. I guess you saw me checking something off here on my list. And um, in terms of thinking about margins, as uh, John said, it doesn't talk about the other costs. And I was thinking about out in California talking to some lettuce grower shippers. And what these folks have done is they've in integrated up the chain instead of building an ethanol plant they started a, they built a bag salad plant have a lot of specialty products they are still negotiating with retailers okay they still have this uh, issue mentioned by Chuck of having people tell them what price they are willing to pay and um, then the other thing that's happening is they have more value added but there's also a more stable market for them uh, the price of their product isn't nearly as highly correlated with the price of bulk lettuce, commodity lettuce, as you think it would be, and it's because of those other costs. So you see this more stable price for them, a more stable retail price for bag lettuce, but it's being driven in part because that commodity lettuce is a less important share of their product. So when we look at those margins, it's not just who's capturing them, or, but it's also about is it an input cost or um, is it about some sort of market power? So. Brian? Yeah, thank you. And thanks for being, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I always like being the fifth one. There's a little left to say. 
Um, I think the I think the important part of this, though, is we, it's interesting how today listening to this, I think all of you, you know, you go from one end of the table to the other, and the difference in perspectives that happen for the same thing. It's like the elephant, you know, the blind man's trying to tell if it's an elephant or not, and people feeling around a different thing. But in this case, I think it's important to keep in mind that um, these business organizations and market structures are a spectrum of alternatives. So John was talking about open markets and how important those are. Uh, uh, he didn't share his views on where he thinks there's issues of competition there, and another person saying that clearly these margin issues show that there's a lack of competition in markets. And that's kind of where economists are at this. There's a spectrum of competition here from open markets to complete vertical integration and monopoly that we're concerned about. But in that context, um, I, would, I guess it's kind of a challenge to think about is that competition is not only about that open market that we fixate on, that if you look at contracts, you look at vertical integration, you look at emergence of local foods, organic foods, and so on. All of those, in an economist's view, are responses to competition. They promote competition markets, they develop new products, and they come out of trying to find ways to, to move through the market. So we have had concerns about pricing at farm levels. We've had concerns about pricing at wholesale levels. Retail certainly is there. For the most part, the research on that is, is fairly suggestive that there is some sign of market pressure, but that it's not enough to offset the competitive advantages of scale and integration and the types of innovations. I, you know, the other challenge is to think about business processes as an innovation process in itself. So maybe jumping ahead to one of your questions, but from a policy perspective, limiting business organization structures and limiting those opportunities is sort of a suppression of innovation in the sense of how the, biz, the, the market structure organizes. So to think broadly, a bit broadly about those issues, and the importance becomes really defining, is there an issue of competition, which is the difficult question. So uh, two things. One is uh, if I can encourage all the speakers to speak into the microphones so folks in the back can hear. That's the first thing. The second thing is just to ask a question that is uh, notable and underscores the iterative nature of this process. So at the last event in Washington, this issue, which is one of the big issues on people's minds, is one we want to grapple with more intensely. Call it the uh, wholesale retail differential or whatever from farm gate to retail, I think is what Patrick called it. Here's the question, and I encourage everyone here and everyone who's watching and, and uh, uh, going to follow later, uh, commodity prices for farmers go up and down, but retail prices tend to stay higher once they go up. The consumer and the farmer both lose. Where is this margin all going? Um, we've had some discussion on this point. For others who have experience or research, please share with us so we can help grapple with this question. Let me go to another point that was raised inherent and, and let uh, Mary start on this, which is the nature of the contracting. So one form of the market structure that has evolved over time is having more uh, spot market driven price discovery to a greater reliance on forward contracting with more limited spot markets. I think um, the statistics offered by Todd Wiley earlier was that there's only five to six percent of hog sales are driven by spot market with a lot of contracts that are going to be pegged with an open term. And I guess, Mary, I'd ask you, having sort of thought some about this dynamic, is whether it's uh, effective or whether there are concerns that you'd want to raise with respect to it. Well, I have to say that I'm no expert on price, and I'm sitting among a bunch of economists as a sociologist, so I'm not going to address the price issue because that's not something I'm going to model or, and think about the price. I think the important thing about contracts and the way we've seen consolidation happen is that there are other issues and there's other social and community environmental issues that are really important in this. And at the farm level, I think one of the big issues is um, impacts on choice and autonomy. And we've heard some of those discussions today, but as you start to think about what happens with contracting, there becomes, a, there's a lot more specifications, particularly as you move from uh, marketing contracts into production contracts about, you know, what can be grown, how it can be grown, um, what kinds of, in the, in the livestock arena, what kinds of uh, med medicine and um, veterinary health can be given to it. And so really you're moving, um, decision making away from the farmer and um, into the hands of absent management. And as you do that, that is also a way to move profit away from the farmer and out and into the hands of other people who control the contracts. And so I think that that's really important in terms of thinking about choice um, and autonomy and just that natural idea that farmers are really interested I believe, having grown up on a farm um, and hearing the farmers talk today, are very interested in 
thinking through themselves, how they want to care for animals, what kinds of crops they want to, to plant, how they want to um, manage their soil and manage uh, their water and all these kinds of different things. And I think that's the question we start to face as we see this consolidated markets happening. And so I don't really want to, for me, it's not so much a question of price, um, even though I think in jurisprudence you have to, you know, it's been kind of defined down to that, that question. But I think that there are these other questions um, that, that are at play. And the other thing I would just say, too, from our work on this, um, you know, there are quite a bit of uh, stories about packers in particular talking about consolidating to be large enough to provide the protein um, counter, for instance, for large retailers. And so that is actually given as a reason to consolidate. Um, and so the retail sector does seem, I mean, we didn't have a national retail sector, right, for a long, long time, and we've got one now at the national level, and we're now forming um, global retail sectors. So the question is, as we've had, in the, if a national retail sector starts to force consolidation, what will happen as we get to a global retail sector, and what does that mean for um, any kind of um, smaller independent players anywhere along the chain, be it um, farmers, or small processors or, or small retailers. And I think that there are a number of questions about that in terms of, um, of how the food chain is organized. Chuck, I want to turn to you. What Eddie uh, Y said, which Mary has echoed, and I'd like you to maybe explain, if you could, if, if it indeed is what you were suggesting. If you do sign these contracts, he, his words is you're dead. What's, what's that sentiment? Is that, is that what Mary was saying, your autonomy is limited? Um, why is there such a uh, concern about these contracts? Obviously, a lot of people are, um, have done it. Um, could you give a little more explanation on, 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 from the farmer perspective how these contracts are viewed? Well, my, I try and negotiate my pigs, and my typical day starts out. I, will, I happen to have the luxury of living in north central Iowa, so I have, from a, from a livestock pork producer, I happen to have the luxury of having access to almost every multi large packer that there is. So it's a little bit easier for me to negotiate a price than it is maybe someone who only has uh, one or two major packers in their backyard. But my typical day starts out, I will make the rounds. And I always tell the packer, I'm making the rounds. And I will call up to six different packers. And the question I will ask them is if they need any pigs. As an example, uh, today, um, I, I called them up and said, "Are you gonna, I'm trying to negotiate pigs for next week. Do you need any pigs next week? Well, uh, when you call six packers and you're to the fourth one and no one needs any pigs, uh, you start to get a little nervous that you might not be able to get your, your pigs sold. And you're in such a time-sensitive system, as, to as Todd Wiley said, uh, you know, you got pigs. I got pigs coming on Monday, and I have to empty a barn. And so you're struggling to try and figure out, oh, my God, where am I going to move these pigs? So that's, that's the reason you would sign those contract shackle space agreements, because they always afford you an opportunity to sell your pigs because if I call one particular packer, and I won't name who it is, their, their comment to me, the buyer's comment is, you know, we're 94% bought. I said, so what? You're 94% bought for June. You have enough committed pigs on shackle space agreements that 94% bought does not scare me. 100% bought scares me because now I can't sell pigs. So it be... It, it becomes very nerve-wracking when I'm trying to negotiate pigs that I'm the only one out there trying to do it. And that's facetious because I'm not the only one, but I'm one of the few that it's trying to do it. And I'm going to influence the market of probably 50% of the hogs that are out there that are on shackle space agreements but are on pricing formulas that are driven off of what I negotiate. Now, when the DOG, DOJ called me, they said, well, couldn't you actually have access to infi inside information? And that's true. Uh, there's, there's market reports that come out, and we talked about market transparency. I, th I think it's very, very important that there be accurate information available to the marketplace so that we understand what the market is. So at, at, in the morning, at about 11 o'clock, there's a morning report that comes out, and I'm always looking at that to see what is being offered. And it, uh, 3 o'clock, another report comes out, and you're trying to figure out what's being offered. And there's cutoffs for those time periods, and packers will oftentimes bring you a bid at 9.31, because 9.30 is the cutoff. 
And so if they're going to bring you a higher bid, they bring it to you at 931 because then it won't make the morning report. Or if they're going to sell you something, you're going to buy something from you in the afternoon, they'll come at 131 because 130 is the cutoff for the afternoon report. Or in most cases recently, most of the negotiated pigs have happened in the live market because most of the contracts that are shackle space agreements that are signed with packers are available and are driven off of the, what we call the Western Corn Belt, which is a lean base market. And so the live market doesn't influence that. So when they need pigs, they know how to buy them so as not to influence the cost of all their pigs. Now, is that bad? It's legal. They can do it. If what I do, I'd probably do the same thing if, if somebody made the rules that way. But it is, it, is a, it is a challenge. I mean, we're all human, and uh, the tendency will be to game the system and work the system to your advantage. John, Chuck, Chuck uh, touched on a number of aspects of the dynamics of how prices are set and how these contract relations work. Um, do you have a uh, concern on this transparency issue, or how would you suggest we uh, think about it? Well, the, uh, the transparency, the mandatory price reporting was mentioned this morning, and it, it's, uh, it has been a significant change, I think, in the way the hog market is priced. Pork is not included in the mandatory price reporting at this time. There is uh, the data available, but as, as Chuck said, it, there are rules there. It comes out, you know, it has to be in by 930. It gets reported at some point after that. Uh, previous to that, there were people that knew the phone number of the market reporter that was collecting the information all over the phone. And so, for example, they, they would call, this would be a farmer, would call Des Moines' office, find out what that individual was hearing. Well, the individual is not hearing anything because the data is transferred electronically and at a certain time. And, and so there's been, there's been some changes. So yes, there's transparency in that the prices are all reported according to to law and they get passed out at certain times, but you don't see a lot of the formation. Uh, and I don't know if Chuck does this, I know on the cattle side there are private sector, there are clubs that they join that they get messages to their text, uh, their phone as soon as a trade occurs. So a packer, you know, offers me a bid at, at 10.30, at 10.31 it's punched into the phone and it gets sent to everybody who's in the system. And so they found that the, the public sector is not providing them enough information through to, to make the kind of decisions that you need to make. They want to hear it from other people. Brian, you studied this closely as well. Do you have certain thoughts you want to share on this? Um, well, I, I think I agree, you know, agree pretty much the transparency is that given in the markets, that ability to be able to make decisions based off of reasonable prices. Uh, my concern, I guess the concern I'll voice is usually transparency comes on to mean let's have a policy about a requirement for 25 or 30 percent of hogs or in the open market or something like that. And that creates a dilemma for, you know, is that reducing producers' options who are choosing to take contracts or forward purchase versus negotiated price in the same way. So transparency is sort of that, um, you know, you can either regulate these markets or you can look at how do we facilitate that transparency. And John's example is a good example. Um, you know, with, with web-based systems, uh, you know, text messaging and so on, the information system dimension of this, I think is a huge part of market formation that's just starting to get in place in agriculture. And it's one of those elements, again, where, I mean, I'm, you can tell I'm cautious about policy and regulation issues in this, that the market finds a way, that there are ways to get that information out there, that information is important for decisions, and we ought to focus carefully on trying to achieve that point where we make that open market as efficient as possible, as transparent as possible, so that it becomes the choice that makes those decisions that packers and producers want to make to achieve profitability to be able to make those decisions, whichever way that goes. And so, you know, it's kind of that free market. Somebody mentioned the Chicago Economist before, but kind of open market version. The part they miss usually is that there is a need for open markets do fail, and you need to have mechanisms to try to correct those, and a lot of that is transparency, information flows, exchange of information, is absolutely critical to that. And that information includes, um, one other important point here, I think, is quality information. That a lot of what drives incentives for contracts is quality and the timing issues in the shackle space. And a, an open market price is hard over the phone to say, I have hogs that are 51, 52% lean, you know, such and such down the, the grade of that hog, and convince that packer that's what they are, and so you start to contract. We have the mechanisms now to trace animals, traceability protocols, and so on, identify genetics, pass that through the supply chain, and let the open market work better. 
And I think that's a place where policy-wise, um, we really ought to look at how do we facilitate that information structure rather than regulating that information structure. So really facilitation rather than regulation becoming part of that, that uh, objective. John? Phil, just to follow up on one thing, I don't want lost here, and that was what Chuck went through is starting his day and calling six people and sorting this out. How, how much time does that take and is that a daily event? Or is that once a week or once a month when you have hogs to sell? Um, it, it takes a, a long time. In fact, my wife wonders why it takes me so long to do chores in the morning. And I tell her it's well, it's because I spent two hours in the hog building and one hour of it was on the phone trying to, to deal with packers. Um, but you, you kind of get, it doesn't have to be a real long conversation with packers. You can pretty much run through and they'll tell you whether they're sitting pretty good for next week, they really don't need anything, or they'll say, i got to wait until Thursday because Thursday at noon all my committed suppliers turn in what they have for loads, and then I'll kind of know if I have a need or I don't have a need. So you wait till Thursday noon, and then you call in. I think pack, I always worry. I, always, I don't never raise cattle, but I always hear about the show list, and then I always hear about cattle being traded in about a 30-minute time window on Friday afternoon, and I'm always worried if the hog industry ever gets to that point, I'm going to be toast because... My barns are so time sensitive that if I miss the boat and don't get my pigs sold, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do. Yeah. And I guess my point is, is one of the reasons I think people have gone to contracting is a convenience issue. Because uh, that's a lot of work, and particularly if you're studying it, the markets it is, and the timing. It is, but my encouragement to all producers, and specifically as producers get larger, is I'm not asking them to negotiate all their pigs. I'm just saying, for God's sakes, take one load a week and negotiate it, because if, if all of us would just do a little bit, if all of us would recognize the importance of negotiating a market and everybody would do a little bit, it wouldn't depend on all of us to do all of it. So I want to go to Patrick and um, Rachel in a second, but I would want to note we've had a lot of discussion about the role of public policy. There are three concepts that have highfalutin economic jargon, but they've been uh, nicely illustrated. One is concerns about information asymmetry and how to facilitate information that can enable people to make decisions better. That's true for end consumers and for producers. Second, the prior panel talked a lot about what gets called public goods. Um, and intellectual property protection is one response to this concern. So is uh, funding of research, which is something that was called for um, in the prior panel. And then also, I think this point about a market uh, failure, uh, being able to participate in the market, one thing that the Secretary mentioned that's quite interesting is getting broadband to all rural producers so they can participate effectively in the uh, ecosystem, I thought was an important point. Let me go to Patrick and Rachel on the following points worth noting. The level of contracting differs in different commodities between poultry, hogs, and cattle. Is there anything we learned from that comparison that bears on this discussion, Patrick, you might be able to share? Well, I think the kind of question that producers ask is, the surety of uh, being able to market their goods through a contract and may uh, make up for the kind of price uh, volatility. That is, produ producers make a trade-off. They get what they get from a contract is they eliminate some price risk and they eliminate some marketing risk. But I think what's under discussed is that in exchange they pick up a giant amount of contract risk. And this contract risk is in many fold. Mary talked about some of these things, but I think generally one of the things that's not talked about enough is this investment risk, right? Because producers, especially in the hog and uh, broiler industry, have to invest between half a million or a million dollars into a facility to produce an livestock at spec to send to the packer. This is a burden that is placed on the grower or producer, but yet the liability is not on the buyer at all. And this is a significant overhang, a debt overhang on farmers that is tied to a contract. This becomes especially perilous when integrators or packers fail. Now this year, a whole bunch of hog pro uh, pork processors failed in the southeast, and Pilgrim's Pride has been under bankruptcy, and many, many uh, growers and producers that have this overhang of debt that was required upon them for their contracts. 60% of hog producers that are under contract are required to make giant capital investments just to secure their contract, either through upgrades or new buildings. This risk on the, on the debt side, combined with the risk of 
uh, contractor failure presents a significant risk to, to producers that I think is downplayed on the efficiency and uh, benefits and convenience of marketing at a consistent price. I think this kind of balance is not really discussed hardly at all in, in real terms for producers because it is a significant risk. And that's on top of the risk of the liability, the environmental liability for dealing with manure management and any other risks that the contract that that uh, producers might have. I mean, I think the, the real understanding, when you think about what's going on in the broiler industry, 99% of birds are produced under contract. It's virtually 100% integrated. Growers don't own the birds. They just produce the birds on a service. But the reality is that 50% of, of poultry producers only have one or two integrators that serve them. So there's really no market at all. And more th about 60% of them don't feel they have no alternative to the the integrator they're dealing with now. So this contractor risk can lock producers in, and they can lock them into a, some very significant cost problems, both on the debt side, on the contractor failure side, and on the liability side, and many of them have nowhere else to go. So there is a difficulty with the, the uh, negotiated price marketing, and it's a real difficulty. But the reality is on the hog sector, you're talking about 10% of the trades that are on the open market, and they are influencing the prices on the formula side that could be half or more of the, of the uh, marketplace. So that also creates some kind of situations where a tiny number of buyers on the spot market can really uh, manipulate a thin market like hogs pretty easily, theoretically. So we're concerned about all of these things. The, con the, the contract risk is significant. It needs to be talked about in alignment with this overall benefit of the contract. You want to jump back in on that, Mary? Yeah, I, would, I just wanted to say that I think one of the big things about contracts is that um, as Patrick was mentioning it, if you have options on where you want to contract, and, and uh, Bill Heffernan has done some studies in Union Parish in Louisiana over 30 years, and as the options from integrators went down from four in 1969 to two in uh, 1990, or 1981, and then one in um, uh, 1999, Farmers were much less satisfied with the contracts, felt much more locked into arrangements that they, that they didn't really want to choose, and felt like they had no power in negotiating the contract. So I think it's really important to, I mean, contracts in and of themselves can be really wonderful things for reducing risks, but only if there is a, there's no power in um, asymmetry, asymmetry there. You've got to have equal, some, some sort of equal um, positions of power to no negotiate a good contract, and that has to do with if you have options of where you're going to sell things and, and where you're going to market. And, you know, we've seen this in the poultry industry to some extent in the hog industry. I think, I think it's, uh, um, you know, that there just aren't, if you have a poultry plant in one place, uh, uh, um, there, there's a circle around there, and that's the only place you can get a contract. And we're starting to see that a little bit in hogs. Maybe not as much, but uh, uh, that's what's happened in poultry, and I think that that's a serious uh, uh, concern that a lot of people have about contracts. Rachel, you want anything to this? Uh, sure, a, a couple of things here. Um, I guess the first thing I will I will do is speak directly to uh, Mary and Patrick for a moment, and uh, in terms of contract choice and so on, I, I I will come back to one of our earlier speakers previously, who uh, pointed out that he. He chose a contract, and certainly a contract is a, a question of what you get out of it, and I think to some extent what you're both talking about is there can be a big difference in negotiating power when you initially enter the contract, whereas what happens five years later, ten years later, when the initial contract was up, and I just kind of wanted to draw that out. Um, then the next thing I would say about this is two more comments. One about as the number of integrators goes down, and what I was thinking about is the uh, California sugar beet industry, or maybe I should say the uh, former California sugar beet industry. And it's true that we lost all the processors, but that's because they weren't making any money either. And so it's always a, a question of watching in a specific area uh, if it's something about the long-term trend in the industry versus decisions made by individual processors for their own reasons. And then the other thing, which is um, a bigger thought question for folks in the audience, really, and some people may be on contracts that are like this, but I was just thinking about there's, there's a lot of ways to peg price that don't involve a spot price. If you think about broilers, all the, contract, all the chickens are contracted. 
or owned by the uh, processor. So the question is, how do they set that contract price? They've got a different mechanism. And so maybe one thing we might be seeing, whether we'd want to see it or not, of course, depends on the specific contract terms, but price determination mechanisms that are based on something other than a spot price that's perhaps increasingly unrepresentative of the price that producers in the industry as a whole are obtaining. So that's, that might be something to think about for the future. If the spot market is unreliable, if there's not an, enough of a market for the transparency to be effective, then uh, maybe other mechanisms need to be explored. So I just want to underscore sort of any call for further information and thoughts. Rachel's two great points. The first one involving what you might call the um, renewal contract situation and how to avoid what economists call ex post, after the fact opportunism, once someone is locked in to a particular purchaser, how do you ensure that they are not taken full advantage of? If you maybe had the right arrangements at the front end of the contract that gave you some protection that could help. Other industries, uh, electric power comes to mind, has regulations that deal with these sorts of situations. The other point you made about other price setting other than relying on the spot market, um, for those who have experienced knowledge as to those sorts of case studies, we really welcome them. That's valuable information for us. Let me um, ask a question that came up to Chuck, and you can maybe respond. Others can respond. The feeling of a lack of power by producers begs the question, are there cooperatives that provide a mechanism to enable producers to come together as a way of essentially countervailing uh, market power? that can ensure a fair price for sellers. The uh, Congress has passed a law that people here are probably well familiar with, the Capra Volstead Act, which provides an important and constructive role for cooperatives in the chain that we've been talking about. Is that um, a part of this picture, Chuck, that you've thought about? Does it work in, in, in your sector? I know other sectors may be more or less uh, susceptible to cooperatives playing a role than others. Um, there are. Uh, there's a marketing organization called Producers Life Livestock Marketing Association out of, uh, I believe it's Sioux City. Um, they work with smaller producers trying to, uh, to help them market uh, their hogs. Um, for the most part, if you can deliver a semi-load of pigs, you can negotiate pigs uh, because you pretty much have the ability to deliver a, a scale of pigs that a, that a packer is willing to negotiate with. I will tell you though that it is, it is true that the more loads you have to negotiate, the more willing they are to negotiate. I've had instances where I've offered two loads at a price or four loads at a higher price and they'll take the four loads at a higher price. And versus if you didn't have the four loads you wouldn't have got the higher price. So there is some of that going on. Um, Which th that, that's the case for cooperatives, in other words, if you can right. aggregate if you could, the if amount you could, of your if you selling. you can negotiate those. The problem is, though, it's like I had a, a, a conversation with one of the buyers there this morning. Um, right now, it's extremely difficult to market pigs because we had a fire at Logansport, Indiana, and there's such a delicate balance between supply and demand of hogs that that plant being down, every day that it's down, those pigs have to be killed somewhere else. So there's a push of those pigs to the west. And currently, we're having to deliver pigs from north central Iowa to Crete, Nebraska to try and find. We have to go west to find a packer that will kill our pigs because going east is getting inundated with these pigs coming from the east because of that slaughter plant. So it is a very delicate balance. Rachel, you wanted to jump in on that point? I, I did because, again, California has some uh, instances of different cases like that as well in, in wine grapes. And this is an interesting case not just because of the product but because the indus industry is very differentiated, but there's a producer's negotiating group called Allied Wine Grape Growers, and it will, um, it will come in and help members negotiate for their grapes. And more importantly, given some of the things we talked about with contract risk earlier, uh, it, they, they insure. They insure each other as a group. So if your uh, buyer goes broke and you don't get your payments, then everybody's contributed into a pool so that you don't realize uh, zero return on that year's crop. And an another interesting case is processing tomatoes. There's no real spot market there. Okay, this is one of the industries that uh, motivated my earlier comment. And what they have instead is an industry producer negotiation group, the California Tomato Growers Association, and they negotiate with the processors. Now, these are contract prices, but it's a, it's a very pr transparent negotiation process in terms of how the prices are settled and what the processors are paying for base price and for quality. So, so I, I want to go to uh, another question that emerges from what Chuck just said. <laughs> 
which is the amount of distance you have to ship um, because of the changing market structure. Um, for some people, and uh, in Colorado we'll have a local producer of cattle who is related to such a story, it's maddening that they can actually produce cattle, let's say in this case in Colorado Springs, they want to ship it to Whole Foods, say, or other uh, outlets that might be in Denver or Boulder, but in order to do that, they've got to ship their uh, cattle down to Texas, where the you know, distribution facility is. Um, and so that makes it a lot harder to have locally grown um, food. And it also makes it harder for people when they're buying food to know what truly is local. So we've adverted to before, and people have raised this issue about consumer awareness. And I think, if I heard Secretary Vilsack say that there's a real push to know your food, know your farmer. To what extent is there local awareness about where their food's coming from? Is an advantage to be local? Do those markets exist? Um, I, I think Mary said you want to start on that one? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think one of the, the issues you just raised about Colorado Springs to Texas is one of, again, um, Whole Foods is a very dominant player in the natural grocery sector, right? So there's very little competition in some sense with, with uh, Whole Foods. Um, the, so what has happened is we see these na more national scale players create more national scale infrastructure. And so we've eliminated a lot of the infrastructure that used to exist for um, local. Either it, it, it's, it, it's processing facilities. Um, it is uh, um, local warehousing, it's packing and sorting facilities, all of these kinds of things that that infrastructure no longer exists. And, you know, the, argu the argument is how come it disappeared? Just because, simply because it was inefficient or are there are other reasons? And I think that's something that, to tease out. But that makes it very, very difficult as we start to see these local markets. So there's a very vibrant market, for instance, in farmers markets. What do we got? Like somewhere over 5,000 farmers markets across the country. Um, they're very competitive normally. Um, the, the, the producers there, are, are it's a very competitive market. Farmers really have to be on the top of their game to do it. They're providing um, a lot of information to consumers and so on. But once you move out of that particular um, direct relationship between farmer and consumer, then the infrastructure issues become really, really uh, important. And it's particularly difficult for meat vendors of any sort at the local level because the costs um, um, a local farmer at the market in Columbia, Missouri, for instance, says it's $400 to slaughter his, his uh, beef cattle at um, a small, very small scale, but actually medium scale for a USDA inspected locker plant in Missouri um, versus, you know, some of the industry averages are, you know, probably closer to a quarter of that. And so that, you know, part of that is because rendering is consolidated, so nobody can sell their byproducts anymore. I mean, there's a lot of issues that all, all play into that. So I think that those are some of the issues that we have to start thinking about at the local level. But that infrastructure, and it becomes really apparent too as we go to a global scale. Um, a lot of global players in the food system are at the global scale where there's a global retail sector, you know, there's a global trader sector, trading sector in, in, in grains. And so that raises the question of what happens at the, um, you know, if we've seen these changes from local to national scale, then what happens when we go to the global scale? And finally, I would say something that doesn't have anything to do with price and efficiency whatsoever, but questions about redundancy and resilience in the food system. And um, that's what I think lo a lot of folks in the local arena, it's not just a matter of trying to differentiate their price and or their products and get into new markets because they're frustrated with other markets or they see these as a a marketing opportunity, but there are some questions about societal goods, about, um, you know, if we have redundancy, that allows us to absorb more shocks. Um, if you have a highly concentrated system, it's much more difficult to absorb um, shocks, um, be they financial shocks or environmental shocks or what they are. So I think that redundancy and resilience is another important thing to think about in terms of um, local markets and what, what kind of societal goods that they actually provide. For people. John, I, I want to segue back to something that a couple farmers said on the earlier panel. The role of the importance of niche uh, players or specialty offerings. Local food could be in that category. Um, broadly speaking, how significant do you think this idea is of niche development 
And is local uh, sort of food a good example of that? Uh, how does it um, overcome the obstacles that Mary's talked about, and, and what sorts of any policy uh, responses are appropriate? Well, and I've often used this quote, and I probably ought to look to see if it's factual or not, but I think one of the Webster's, <laughs> one of Webster's definitions of niche is a small crevice in an environment in which to hide. <laughs> and uh, oftentimes, that, uh, from, a, from a niche market that standpoint, that's what you're trying to do, is find some place so you don't have to com compete on a commodity scale. Uh, that you're doing something unique, you somehow differentiate that product, and whether it is by distance or how the animal is produced or the genetics of it or whatever it is, there's some distinguishing factor. And then you have to have a market infrastructure or system that allows you to, to prove that differentiation because the flip side of it is protecting the consumer, right? If suddenly there's a huge increase in interest in natural and there's no strong definition of natural. By golly, mine are natural too. Pay me more money, right? Uh, then you get into consumer fraud issues. And so how do you protect that? Um, I read in, and this is more mainly pop, popular press and trade industry, that local uh, is the fastest growing or the hottest item in restaurants this year. But it's starting from a very small base. So back to your question, is this a significant outlet? Uh, I think you will find some individuals that can do very well. Uh, the Whole Foods and the natural beef or how, whatever specs they had started out as a niche that some producers got into, but as a, as a business, I'm assuming here, how do we get this national distribution, how do we do it cost effectively, it's having centralized uh, packing plants and distribution systems, and so now suddenly we're back into transportation logistics. Our commodity systems, that's one of the things they did very, very well, is efficiency and logistics. You can run into some of the same pricing issues as you get into local and, and uh, these niche markets. Oftentimes they're based off of the commodity price, so it's a premium to the commodity. Uh, farmers markets, it may be more of a direct negotiation, but uh, some of those same issues will follow you into those niches. Patrick, if I recall correctly, your comments talk a little bit about the experience in the organic sector, which uh, was developed off of uh, certain regulations of what could constitute organic. What do, we, what do we learn from that? And more generally, what do, what do you think of the promise of uh, niche development, niche, niches? I think this question really reflects the the consolidation in the marketplace. And I think as you saw the number of cattle uh, slaughter uh, companies decline and the number of facilities decline, this kind of creates a barrier to entry. There's a classic consolidation impact on the marketplace. It creates a barrier to entry, the capital cost of building a new slaughter facility, and the barrier of finding supplies in a marketplace that's locked up by captive supply agreements creates a real difficulty uh, uh, and an impact and prevents, effectively prevents a lot of reconstruction of these local marketplaces. In organic, I think what we saw was the promise of a niche market that grew very, very quickly and many small producers uh, took advantage of that. They were quickly swamped in many respects by the giant food companies. Of the 30 biggest food companies, a third bought up organic brands within the first 10 years and half launched their own organic brands. And in organic milk producers, the organic dairy uh, farms, thought that they could kind of outrun the system, I think, for a long time and made a, a premium. But when the milk prices collapsed in 2007, the dairy milk prices came down faster and harder. And suddenly, there was a very consolidated market where a very few buyers are buying organic milk from dairy farms. And they were especially squeezed and faced the dairy crisis harder and and earlier than I think other dairy farmers did, which was quite terrible for all of them, but earlier and worse for organic. That, la that note leads into my last question, which I'll just go through the panel for a minute or so. The question is twofold. One is, is it a marketplace today where farmers can start up and compete on the merits and have a shot to make it? And to the extent there are barriers or impediments what are they, and what, if anything, can policy do about that? Brian, how do you size that up? Um, 
Well, we do, you know, this, this conversation about niche markets is part of that. I, you know, it's, it's when John's comment about uh, the crevices is, is kind of enlightening because the, the larger commercial food chain, which produces highly high quality, cost effective food that feeds the 9 billion people we've heard about, is sort of that, that piece that helps maintain that. You know, one producer earlier talked about their cost driven. It maintains that, that cost driven food system where you're trying to provide that, which opens up those crevices. I mean, it's literally that piece where when people have make a choice to go to local or organic or, or producers, those opportunities arise. The ability to do that, I think one of the biggest issues is capital, which came up earlier, which we haven't talked much about, is capital formation in these markets. And to that extent, competing on the merits becomes the ability to enter, you know, the, bar the barriers to entry issues. And the challenge today is even for relatively modest farm operations, you know, with land values in, you know, what they are in Iowa now, five, six thousand bucks you're at down here. <laughs> we don't know that in Minnesota yet. Um, but if you look at those types of barriers to entry, it's just difficult to get in. And, and the fact in agriculture is there are large economies to scale to that. So one of the issues that did come up earlier is how do we finance uh, agriculture? Um, and what's happening, I mean, we, we can talk about integrators being part of that financial model, and of course, you know, linking with larger production firms to gain access to capital. We look at the farm credit system that exists to provide access to capital. And all of those things help foster competition without putting necessarily market restrictions on. They're sort of facilitating aspects of this. So that capital side is really important. And a piece of this that's, I know in Iowa and other places, very controversial, but you, you might as well say it is, the only access to capital in agriculture is primarily debt capital. And no other industry in the country focuses primarily on debt capital. There's very little equity that can come into this industry from outside. And we get upset because it goes to the large producers or the large integrated production companies. But if, for example, if you start a small organic company and looked at cooperatives as an example of this, offering shares for people to buy in in community situations, you're providing facilitation with capital in innovative ways, micro lending or those aspects. Are there ways to create innovation in that market that does open up these channels? And rather than blaming the big person for foreclosing markets, we're not allowing the opening of people to get into these markets in many cases. So I keep saying facilitation, but I think that's where we need to look at is how do we form those necessary conditions to get capital into markets? Rachel. All right. So um, certainly Brian made a lot of key points here. And so I will, I will just throw out a couple other things. Going back to John's earlier comments about niche markets, uh, finding a market and finding a market you can grow and keep from scratch isn't easy. Whether you're starting a farm business or you're trying to redirect the one you have, uh, certainly something like community supported agriculture where you get customers to subscribe. This works in the produce industry. Apparently it can also work in meats on a very small scale. That's one way of getting money into your business uh, at the same time where you're cultivating a direct market. Uh, we had an earlier comment about, on an earlier panel, about how much of this small scale stuff can really work and, and that's a good question. By definition, a niche is a niche and I don't know how many little crevices folks have to hide in in, in total. Uh, the other thing that, that I will mention, um, certainly that hasn't come up in this panel or actually that much except for the gentleman from North Carolina earlier, which is uh, certainly last night when I got here, my dad and my friend were at a uh, pesticide training uh, session, which I bet a lot of other people went to too. And regulatory compliance is a big cost. California, I guess you could say we're the, the leader or, or in last place. Uh, depending on how you feel in terms of regulation of agriculture. And it's a huge concern. People spend a lot of time on it and people spend a lot of money on it. And if you're starting from scratch, that's, that's another big challenge uh, that certainly hasn't been discussed a lot today, but it matters. Mary mentioned about environmental compliance. That's just one small piece of uh, regulation of agriculture. If I could just build on what what Rachel was just saying. I think that there are a couple of policy levers that aren't working very well for, um, for uh, small scale growers and this has to do with uh, um, uh, compliance issues around uh, a, reg a regulatory infrastructure does not work very well for small scale. And often this regulatory infrastructure is really um, built for the larger scale that, that um, we've, we've seen emerge in agriculture and it doesn't work well, very well for small scale. And I would say this is particularly true around food safety governance. And um, you know, there's new rumblings about what f what's going to happen with food safety regulations. We're already seeing produce auctions in Missouri um, run primarily by um, 
you know, Amish Mennonite farmers and other farmers who, these, these are real open auctions for produce, we've seen those um, be impacted perhaps this, this summer. There, there's um, some fear about it because of good agricultural practices, um, uh, which is a voluntary regulation, which seems to be now co um, compulsory for a lot of produce growers. So this, the way food safety governance happens, um, it, it's, it's, not, it's not very well thought out, and it doesn't, food safety governance is not going to be appropriate. At all, the same kind of things is not going to be appropriate at all scales um, of, of production and consumption. And I think it's really important to think hard about how that happens so that we don't end up with some of the same issues we've had in, in terms of pesticide um, um, regulation or worker safety regulation and, and so on. And this is not to say regulation isn't useful and necessary. It's just to say that we have to think about what are the appropriate skills and how, how that, that works. And I think that's really important. And the last thing I would say, too, is that I think it's really important to think about these larger goals of I mean, we're talking about issues of concern to farmers, but these are issues of concern to the larger society as well. And you know, how our landscape looks. Um, and I think somebody on an earlier panel mentioned something about Iowa being kind of known for corn, basically driving through, all you see is corn. When this was a cornucopia of a number of different products, a number of different landscapes, um, it, you know, just maybe 40 years ago, 40, 50 years ago. And so, you know, that has biological diversity implications, that has um, um, implications for wildlife, for water quality, for water quantity, all of these kinds of things. And I think that those things become very important to the issues we're addressing in consolidation and, co and competition because those are larger societal goals that we could incur that are tightly linked to the industry structure. Great. I think the question was you know, getting started, and I think it's always been difficult to get started in agriculture. I think back to uh, when I was growing up and people I knew that worked at night shift someplace but farmed during the daytime. Uh, that continues today. We talked about part-time farmers. I mean, they've been farming full-time and they've gone back to a job. So I understand the difficulty. The capital it takes, and Brian talked about this, we often talked about the way you get capital is either you're born into it or you marry into it. Uh, the interest is a little higher on one of those than the others, but <laughs> the, the, uh, the other role that has come, was mentioned earlier, is the role that contracts have played or integrators have played in helping to secure some of those loans. If, if I don't have a section of grandpa's land behind me, but I have a contract, am I able to access a loan? The contract risk that, that was mentioned is quite real. So they're going to investigate what's the integrity or the stability of the company behind it. But beyond conventional agriculture, doing what we've done or what Dad did, I th we see a lot of interest. We hear it's in the press a lot. We have meetings, and there's a lot of interest that's featured in the newspapers. How many numbers it actually is, I'm not sure, of uh, the, s the smaller farmers, whether it's uh, the welfare-friendly pork like Nyman Ranch has 400 plus growers in a welfare-friendly situation that's much lower capital than conventional production. Some of the farmers markets are uh, uh, high labor uh, uh, produce type things. I think is providing some opportunities that were maybe there 50 years ago, weren't there 10 years ago, and are beginning to evolve some today. Chuck, the question for you is, would you encourage your kids to go into this? And if there are impediments there, what are they? Um, I wish I have uh, two boys in college, and I don't think either one of them are going to come back to farm. And that's unfortunate. Um, I mean, I knew when I was in high school that that's what I wanted to do. When I wore a blue coat, I knew I was not going to go to college. And I was a good student. I got straight A's in school, but I just knew I wanted to farm. I lived, breathed, eat, sleep, rode on the tractor, sat on the fender. I'm sure it wasn't safe, but I never fell off and got ran over. Um, I mean, it, it, uh, you know, it was just a different world back then. And you grew up, it was just a love affair with farming. You just love to do it. And, and it's challenging. And, uh, you know, that's why I'm so passionate about trying to preserve a marketplace. And I think as an industry, as a pork industry, we recognize that we don't have enough pigs being openly negotiated, and we're going to try and address that. We get a little concerned when the government's going to come in and mandate that. I have one of the first confinement barns I built uh, was built with a contract. I was able to walk into the bank, and the bank would lend me the money. 
because of the strength of the contract. And that enabled me to expand my hog operation to take it to the next level. So there's a place for that. But if we want to preserve the marketplace, we have to pre preserve a, a, a negotiator. You know, you talk about s having price set on something else, and different people have talked about, well, let's set the price based on the carcass cutout. Farmers don't operate in that market. We don't negotiate it. We don't produce a carcass. We produce a pig. So we have to have price discovery in a live pig arena in order for us to negotiate in that. And if we lose that market, um, I'll even have a harder time convincing my sons to come back to, to the farm. But I do have a seventh grader that likes to ride the tractor with me and likes to be out there, and he's my exit strategy. <laughs> Patrick, you started the discussion off, but do you want the last word? Anything else to add? I mean, I, I think that question is the question that all the farmers you heard today ask, which is, is this something I would recommend my kids do? And I think many of them say that in a very concentrated marketplace, it's really difficult. And that's why USDA is so interested in figuring out how to leverage more tools for rural development, because it's, more, it's harder now, I think, for farmers to make it in a, a marketplace where there are very few buyers and, and it's difficult to make ends meet. And that question that you see today, and I think you'll see it at the end of the day, is what is the role of consolidation in that question on an intergenerational challenge for farming in America? And that's, that's important. Um, we will uh, take a, a break until 3.30. We'll hear from the enforcers, then come back and hear from any of you else who want to be heard. Thank you all for a great discussion.